Matthew Shepard, the basic leadership course officer for Naval Chaplaincy School. It is my pleasure, on behalf of our commanding officer, Captain Charles Barsoja, to welcome you to Brett Hall, which is the home of professional Naval Chaplaincy. The graduation ceremony today will honor the graduates of professional Naval Chaplaincy basic leadership course 23010. Your presence here today and your continued support of the Chaplain Corps are greatly appreciated. Chaplain students initially complete a five, five weeks of basic military instruction at Officer Development School here in Newport, Rhode Island. These students then advance to the Naval Chaplaincy School to continue their training. In the past seven weeks, they've acquired a basic knowledge of military chaplaincy and the fundamental skills which will enable them to function effectively in all the sea services to include the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marine Academy. Military guests are asked to remain covered for the arrival of the official party, the national anthem, and the invocation. Gunner Sergeant Ariano, assemble the class. Aye, aye, sir. Sir, the glass is formed. Very well. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the national anthem and the invocation. Side boys. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. Side boys. Host. Chapter 
Chaplain Limbo will now offer the invocation. Let us pray. O eternal God of truth, who art in all places and fills all things, the treasure of all good things, the giver of life, we give you thanks for this day of celebration and reckoning. We are thankful for the life you gave us through the parents who loved and nourished us. We are grateful, yes, thankful, for the numerous friends and family members who have encouraged us on the journey of life and help us and help each one of us arrive at this hour. Thank you for the dedicated staff here at the Navy Chaplain School who helped develop each of these committed sailors into newest, our newest professional Navy chaplains. Lord, our God, we ask that you give each of these chaplains the courage to provide divine care to all be leaders of unsolid character models of integrity and give them the strength they will need to weather the rough seas of leadership. Lord, stand with them as they hold themselves accountable each day, staying through the values that guide them. Sustain them as they endeavor to follow the examples of the cloud of witnesses of history's most outstanding naval, naval chaplain leaders these selfless men and women of character who stood guard in the fight for the freedoms that make our country great. Please, Lord, help them to continue to carry out the leg that legacy as they head to the, fleet, to the fleet to care and support your children who gave up many liberties to defend those liberties of our great country. Now, Father, be here with us now, today, and forever. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Limbo. Ladies and gentlemen, remove covers and please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to please welcome Captain Charles Versoja, Commanding Officer of the Naval Chaplaincy School, who will introduce the guest speaker for today's graduation ceremony. Sir? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's always well to begin with thanks, to begin with gratitude and thanksgiving. That's how I start each day. Seems like a good way to begin this ceremony as well. So first of all, thank you. Thank you. I said it yesterday at breakfast when we were together, but one can never be too grateful. The work that we do to meet people's religious requirements, to strengthen their souls for their vocations as warfighters at and from the sea, it's extremely important. Thank you for taking it up, for joining us in doing it. To many of the people we serve, those are the most important things in their life. The state of their soul, how they can connect their confidence in God's grace to the work that they have to do. That work can be difficult, it can be demanding, and there are very few of us to do it. So thank you on behalf of the chaplain, and welcome to the work. I appreciate that. I say the same thing to our families and to the distinguished guests that we have here with us today. Welcome to the home of Professional Naval Chaplaincy, and thank you for being here. Your presence means a lot to the chaplains that you've come to support, but it also means a lot to those of us here who have poured ourselves into supporting them while they've been away from you. Uh, Chaplain Shepard and Gunny Ariano have done a magnificent job of making this place a home away from home for them while they've been here. PS1 Brooks has moved heaven and earth to overcome the administrative impediments and the pay issues that are associated with coming into the service uh, and done a fantastic job of that. But everyone in this place is focused 
on making this the most welcoming and inviting place in our court. And I think that has been your experience here. The staff is probably tired of me saying it, of hearing me say it, of reminding them all the time of how central hospitality is to our mission. And overwhelmingly, the graduates here praise the passion and the expertise of the instructors and the staff, their willingness to invest in the students who come through this place, their dedication to supporting each student with their whole heart, with all of their minds, and tirelessly, even with their bodies. I am immensely thankful for the entire team here at the Naval Chaplaincy School. And before you race out of here today, I know you're going to thank Chaplain Shepard, I know you're going to thank Gunny, but try to find as many of the staff here as you can and thank them on the way. They've been working behind the scenes constantly to make this the best possible experience for you. And they deserve your thanks. And they certainly have mine. Thank you for that. Finally, I'd like to say a word of welcome and thanks to our guest speaker today. Uh, Chaplain Henson's bio is printed in the, the program, and I encourage you to read it when you get a chance, if you haven't already done that. There are a lot of things in there that are interesting. Uh, impressive accomplishments indicated in each line of the text. But none of those are the reasons that I've invited him to be here this morning. I want you to hear from him because in his daily life, he exemplifies the Navy's values of honor, of courage, of commitment to the work that we do, and the values of the Chapman Corps, of being transparent, being collaborative, being objective, creating a predictable environment for spiritual ministry in a world of sometimes straight out chaos. I also want you to hear from them because on the rare occasion that I need to pick up the phone and figure something out with a colleague, I always make sure that, that he's the one on the other end of the phone. And I want you to hear from him as a selfless servant of professional naval chaplaincy, his words of wisdom and his instruction for how to serve in an exemplary way. Chaplain Hinton. Well, again, good morning. Morning. Morning, sir. There you go, that's a good spirit. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me to be here with this great group today. I know this, there's some like Red Sox seats here that are obstructed view if you've ever been in Fenway Park. So I'll move around a, a little bit. And that I can't help myself because I'm so <coughs> excited to be with you. I bring you greetings from the Chief of Chaplains, from the Deputy Chief of Chaplains, Rare Admiral Todd is on the road, as is Admiral Cash. And so I get the opportunity to, at the invitation of the CO to be with you, and I'm just delighted. Thanks to the band for being here. This, the spirit of music is something that's near and dear to my heart, so always having the band as a part of any of these ceremonies enriches it. And I think that may have been the very first time I've seen a Marine use a bosun pipe. So, Connie, well done. Holy cow, that was pretty cool. As the uh, bio says, I've been a Navy chaplain for 29 years. I've been an Episcopal priest for 32 of uh, my years of professional ministry. And so uh, what that means is once upon a time, we had a title in the chaplain corps that went to the senior captain by lineal number. That was called the Gray Shepherd. So that would be me at this moment in time, which my youngest daughter, who's 25, said, Dad, that means you're Gandalf. <laughs> Went, oh great, that means I get to fight the Balrog and stand <laughs> on the bridge? Oh, okay. Well, she also was the child who noticed when my uh, eyebrows turned white first. And she was, it happened about 20 years ago. And she was sitting on my lap and she was messing with my eyebrows and she said, Dad, you have Gandalf eyebrows. And I said, what do you mean? Well, they're all lot long and wiggly and they're white. The next day at the barber shop, those eyebrows got tricked. <laughs> so, so that's part of the, the story of growing old in, in the Chaplain Corps. And I'm delighted to see some friendly faces of people who've journeyed along the way. Some endorsers are here. 
One of the best jobs I enjoyed was at the Armed Forces Chaplaincy Board when I got to work with all the endorsers. I love endorsers. I love what you, you bring in the connectedness and connecting people uh, who serve in the sea services and particularly this group with their own faith resources so that they might help us to be expansive of religious liberty and have religious ministry that is supportive of readiness. Can't do it without you. We need more. So if you're here, be energized and go forth and bring us more people like this. We really need them. And the same thing for y'all. One of the things that you need to do is help tell the story of what you do and why you do it and how powerful it is because this is an age of expansion in Navy chaplaincy. It didn't always used to be that way. And I do want to talk about three particular things uh, this morning, particularly with you all, as you get to go off to your first assignment, either as uh, active component or as reserve component. And the th first of the three things is this. Be professionally curious. You will go far if you're just curious about what is going on in the lives of your people and what they are about. So one of the uh, uh, units that I once took care of had a marine band with it. So I'm not very good at music. <coughs> I'm really good at music appreciation. And so I would go and learn about how their, uh, their days would go and the amount of time spent in the practice room and some of the other things that they would do and their performances go to their performances and hear what was going on in the lives of these particular types of folks, sailors and marines, who have a little bit of an unusual ministry. My first tour of duty was on a submarine squadron. So I had 12 boats, and I would wander around from boat to boat and try and figure out you know, what a sonar tech does and how, how is that important. Get people to tell me about their jobs. And oh, if they tell you about their jobs, they will tell you about their lives. And after a while, trust will be grown and they will tell you about the problems in their lives. And you'll be available to them in ways that perhaps hadn't been possible before. Train with your Marines. If you're with Marines, you can go out in the field and get dirty with them. And they love that. Be careful about getting broken, though, because we're a little bit older than those for those 18 to 25-year-olds. So, you know, exercise prudence. Be as innocent as a dove and as wise as a serpent. Uh, but if you show up, man, 90% of chaplaincy is just showing up and being available in people's lives. I have fond memories of standing on the bridge of USS Lake Erie on the signal bridge and I starlit night in the south of Australia with a QM1 and he and I had a sextant out and I was a mathematician before I was an Episcopal priest so I love math and I love spherical geometry of all things and so he was helping me learn how to shoot the stars and south of Australia the stars are different <coughs> than we have up here and so it was an experience of a great joy and wonder in the middle of the night with that QM1, who then would tell me about the challenges he had as a parent. And then we were able to help get him some resources and his family to heal. But it all began because we loved the stars together. Or being um, in the middle of the desert in a dust storm uh, with Marines and trying to figure out how to get my uh, mock gear together in, in a dust storm and the Marines uh, do a great job with buddy care in helping one another figure things out. And again, those create those that desire of professional curiosity helps us to engage with folks where they are and, and then we are a part of their lives and they know that we are in their corner and we can help them. Uh, second thing I'd like you to think about is besides being professionally curious, is to have a plan. Don't just be reactive, but to go into your first assignment and spend your first few months there kind of assessing what's going on and then do an act of creative imagination and think three years from now, how do I want this command to look because I have been here? What 
is going to be different in the life of this battalion, in the life of this Coast Guard district, in the life of this ship, because I have been here and I have been conducting ministry, because I've been leading divine services, because I've been caring for the crew. What is going to change because I've been here? And how do I plan for that? How do I reverse engineer that? And think about uh, the resources that I will need for that. And your best partners in that are your RPs. They are our program managers. So if we learn how to engage with them to help us reverse engineer things and resource things, they are brilliant at helping us to succeed and make a difference in the lives of our people that's demonstrable. And we need to think about how we assess that. How do we know that folks are doing well? When we started talking about putting chaplains on destroyers, assessment was a piece of it. How would we know if we were making a difference? We had, to, so we had five years of data on what chaplains were doing, activities. We really weren't able to start making an argument for more chaplains until we started looking at the outcomes of the ministry. And we discerned that, oh, people were thriving a little bit better. There were fewer destructive behaviors, fewer lost man hours from being away from the ship, and fewer unplanned losses. And those things were really relevant to leaders in the Navy. And they started seeing the difference that a chaplain would make in the lives of a crew. And sometimes you're all just involved in things and you don't really take the step back to do that. Well, that's where you, you collaborate with your supervisory chaplain and su senior RPs to learn uh, how to get after that thing. <coughs> one of my real treats as a senior chaplain was to go down on one of my destroyers. It was in June of when I was transferring in August, so it was <coughs> my last time to be on a Navy warship as a fleet chaplain. And I went down there and I was just walking around and the, of course Navy captains, I'm like, y'all, y'all have some stealth. I have no stealth. <laughs> when, I, when I walk down and want to visit a ship, they see these four stripes with that eagle and they go crazy. Uh, and uh, I, re I really regret that. That's one of the things that was really awesome about being a junior officer is you could go and get into places that's more difficult for a senior officer to get in. But I went down there and so the XO comes scurrying down, sir, what's going on? I'm like, hey, I, I, I'm just being tourist. You all have a chaplain aboard. I'm gonna kind of see what you think about whether they're making a difference or not. The XO said, oh, well, we have Lieutenant Scarborough. He's been on board for about two months. And let me tell you, sir, I was really skeptical about having a chaplain as part of ship's company. I, you know, I've been used to getting one when we deploy and uh, episodically. But let me tell you the difference that he's making. I think everyone in the crew knows his name. The number of folks that I've had to send off the ship to get help from other agencies is greatly diminished. And our retention is up and we have not uh, lost sailors uh, to things that we would have in the past. And I just think that's amazing. And I said, really? You think every sailor knows your name? Now, I'm from Missouri, so, you know, the show me state. So I'm like, all right, heck so. I'm going to walk around. Do you mind if I walk around your ship? I don't know. Go right ahead. I talked to every, every member of that duty section. I talked to about 60 sailors over a couple of hours, and every one of them did know their chaplain's name. The divos would come up to me and tell me what he was doing at morning quarters with them with some resiliency training. The suppo would come and, and told me about how he was leading assist and safe talk and taking care of the folks. A religious lay leader came up to me and said the impact that he was having on a person who was not of his own faith and helping him lead religious services while underway. So divine services were being held, religious lay led services were being held. The crew in every way I could discern was thriving because of the impact that chaplain. And that chaplain had a plan. I know he sat down with him and said, tell me what you're doing and why you're doing it. Well, here's where we are in our ship cycle, and here's where I think we'll be three or four months from now, and here's what we're doing. And that just felt so good, right? Planned ministry objectives were being attended to. Do you still teach that? Yes, sir. 
<laughs> One of the few things I took from chapel school, I don't remember much when I was here and listening to someone like me, only it was uh, Rear Admiral White at the time, but I remembered plan ministry objectives. So be professionally curious, have a plan, and then perhaps most importantly, it's not about you. It's about the people entrusted to our care. Chaplaincy tends to go off the rails whenever we have chaplains sitting around talking about chaplain stuff to other chaplains. Where we really begin to thrive <coughs> is when we are talking with each other and with our leaders about what is going on in the life of sailors and how we are impacting them. We got uh, chaplains on destroyers because of a, a two-year campaign plan, but it really started with this. My admiral came up to me and said, Chaps, what are you doing for my sailors? I said to him, Sir, I'm going to help your sailors face death well, live life better, and serve to fulfill their duty. Well, tell me more. So I know I've gotten, you know, your elevator speech. I don't know if you all do elevator speeches, but that's a good thing to have. And he said, tell me more. So I knew I was writing up a little bit, a little bit higher. This was with a four-star admiral. I said, I, I want your folks to be able to face death well because they are part of a team that's going to have to kill, a team that may take casualties. So how do we strengthen purities, people's spirits for being in that? What's our part in that through uh, religious ministry that is expansive of religious liberty and supportive of readiness. I want to lean into that with sailors because at some point a sailor may have to shut a hatch on shipmates because that's how you save the ship. Someday uh, they may have to sit at their console with missiles inbound and still fight the ship. Someday they might have to be like uh, Chapa Capadano and do damage control because every sailor is a damage controlman on a ship in a, in a fight. I don't say that to spook the herd, but that's part of what we do in naval service, is to be part of that, to be part of people's lives, to strengthen their spirits, to be able to accomplish the mission with honor under very trying circumstances. When I was on the uh, aircraft carrier, I used to debrief with the pilots as they were dropping ordnance in support of troops in contact. And they would, <coughs> even though it was righteous and just, the, at least in their, their constructs and in, in my own theological philosophical constructs, sometimes there were collateral damage. We hurt and killed people we ought not to have. And I really wrestled with that. And I wrestled with the effect that had on the spirits of my sailors. And so we dug in, into that through uh, our engagements with them to, to try and seek reconciliation with uh, the fact that we are part of a military organization. And that means both, both the inflicting and taking casualties. So I said, I want them to be able to thrive under those circumstances. Second part was, I want people, your sailor, sir, to be able to live life better. Well, let's face it, 18 to 25 year olds, uh, they're not so good about living life well these days. <laughs> at least we look at the suicide rates and some of the other things uh, that are markers. And I've got three kids, 30, uh, 28, and 25, so they offer me particular insights into their, their uh, lifestyles. And they do have an intact family system, but not everyone. Some folks have uh, extraordinary pressures put on them. And so how do we help them to thrive in their relationships, both individually and, and, uh, and in relation with others? To quote my own uh, religious tradition, uh, St. Irenaeus of Leon once said that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. How do we help all be more fully alive? And then, face death well, live life better, and serve to fulfill their duty. We're in a virtue-based organization. So the idea is that we will courageously honor our commitments, honor, courage, and commitment are part and parcel of who we are. 